Okay, why don't we begin? Um, welcome everyone, good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you're located. Um, uh, uh, today's event is titled Violence and Care, the Besiege and Disabled Afghan Foreign Fighters in Iran. Um, this is our, I've lost track, I believe our third event for this academic year for the Iranian Studies Initiative at um, NYU. My name is Arayn Keshavazian, um, and I'm a member of the uh, Iranian Studies Initiative um, Steering Committee. Um, uh, let me just, before we turn to our, um, uh, before I introduce our, uh, our speaker, Dr. Ahmad Moradi, let me bring to your attention um, our last event uh, for this academic year, um, which will be on December 8th, so roughly a month from now. Uh, note that it's an evening uh, event um, and it's an uh, in person event. Uh, I, I, I believe we're it's hybrid, right, Ali? It's it's going to be yeah, both. In, yes. It'll be hybrid format, so it'll be in person. So those of you who are in New York are able to get yourself to New York. You're welcome to join us in person, but they will also be uh, on Zoom as well. And that uh, will be a um, a, uh, a talk by uh, historian Gregory Brew on his new uh, or forthcoming book titled "Petroleum and Progress in Iran: Oil Development and the Cold War." And we're fortunate to have uh, Yervand Abrahamian as the guest um, uh, speaker or discussant for that event. Um, so mark your calendars December 8th uh, at 5 p.m. Eastern time, either on Zoom or in person. Um, it'd be great to see you in person. Um, uh, but let me uh, turn to our, uh, our event for, this, uh, for, for today. Uh, we're uh, very fortunate to have Dr. Ahmad Moradi uh, with us. Um, he's joining us virtually uh, via um, where he's based from Germany, where he's based. Um, Ahmad Moradi is a postdoctoral fellow at the Free University of Berlin. Before moving to Berlin, he was a postdoctoral fellow at the School of Advanced Studies in the Social Sciences in Paris. Uh, Dr. Moradi received his PhD from the University of Manchester in 2019. He also earned a, a BA or bachelor degree in anthropology from the University of Tehran, as well as an MA in sociology and social anthropology from the Central European University in Budapest. As a social anthropologist, his fields of interest are care and militancy in the Middle East, uh, with a special focus on Iran. His forthcoming book, Labor of Domination explores how revolutionary politics of the Basij uh, as a set of techniques and care practices unravels in the everyday life of Iran's low-income neighborhoods. Um, it's a wonderful study looking at uh, a number of different neighborhoods across Iran and different cities, Tehran, Bandar Abbas, Mashhad, and so forth. Um, in his postdoctoral project, he focuses on the struggles of Afghan disabled foreign fighters to, to demand state care in, in Iran upon their return from regional conflicts. He is also involved in the practice of creative ethnography, the results of which are in, artistic, are in an artistic monograph on the topic of Afghans border crossing in Europe and several exhibitions in Tehran, Budapest, and Amsterdam. So the format for today's event is that the floor will, uh, I'll hand over um, the, um, uh, the floor to uh, Dr. Moradi, who will take about 30 minutes to present uh, his research, ongoing research uh, based on ethnographic work he's been doing over the past several years. Um, then I will change my role as moderator and become the discussant. I, I will uh, share some comments and thoughts and questions and post some questions for about eight to 10 minutes. And then we should have plenty of time um, for questions um, and uh, comments from all of you uh, in the audience. We are asking all of you to uh, put your questions in the, in the chat, and then I will uh, kind of uh, pose them uh, to uh, Ahmed when we get to the Q&A moment. So feel free um, to, uh, uh, to pose your, put your, uh, your questions um, in, in the chat format, and uh, we will we'll get to them in the Q&A uh, period. Um, so without further ado, it's my pleasure to hand things over to uh, Dr. Ahmad Moradi. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Arang, for the introduction and giving me this incredible opportunity to share my research with you today. And thanks to Ali and, and, and Dylan for 
for all the um, arrangement. Let me just share the uh, screen. So you can see it, right? Yes. Okay. Great. Yep. So the topic of my presentation is the interconnection between care and violence in, the, in contemporary Iran. To tease out the relation between the two, I draw on my ethnographic research with the Basij and disabled Afghan ex-combatants in Iran. So my presentation is divided into two halves where I address each case study separately. Um, my ethnography of the Basij, which resulted in the forthcoming monograph, Labor of Domination, looks into the mundane and daily practices of the Basij members in poor neighborhoods. My fieldwork research was mainly concentrated in two neighborhood bases of the Basij. One was located in Bandar Abbas and another in Islamshah, one of Tehran's satellite towns. Observations from these two field sites allow me to discuss what it takes for the paramilitary members of the Basij to live a life as a violent vigilante, low-level state bureaucrat, local, state, local caregiver, and revolutionary militia in a closely knitted social setting like a neighborhood. Since the early years of the revolution, almost all urban neighborhoods in Iran have hosted a paramilitary base of the Basij. They were one of the first undertakings of the revolutionaries immediately after taking control of the cities and were envisioned to be central in policing the urban social order. In the years of the Iran-Iraq war in the 1980s, the Basij bases played an active role in mobilizing and recruiting volunteers for the front and providing necessary combat, combat forces. In the, in the post-war years, the Basij maintained its presence in neighborhoods and its bases continued serving as places for cultural, political, and military activities. To explain what drew me to the Basij of Neighborhood as the smallest operating unit of the Basij, I need to make a little bit of a detour. During my fieldwork in Iran between 2015 and 2016, I was pretty much inspired by the work of the Italian author Dino Buzzati and his novel, The Tartar Steep. In The Tartar Steep, a young, a young aspiring military man is tasked but by the central state to supervise a remote fort in the mountains and be, prepared, and be prepared for the impending invasion of the Tartars. Despite his initial expectations, he soon realizes that he, all his life at the fort is going to be consumed by waiting, waiting for the imminent inv invasion of the Tartars for which he must prepare. So what we end up reading in the novel is all about the monotonous and repetitive art of routine duties and how the young military man does his best to implement on the ground the decisions that appear to be made by a faceless bureaucratic hierarchy. Cuts at the gravitational pull of duty and service and of course the impending Tartar invasion, he finds himself pretty much like the fort itself neglected by the headquarters and all but forgotten. The novel serves as a bitter comedy about bureaucracy at the margin of the state and the frustration of trying to deal with seemingly arbitrary controlling system while one is in the futile pursuit of an unattainable goal. Referring to Buzzati's work here serves in no way as a, as a comparison. It's more like tapping into a rich literary text to convey affects. My ethnography offers similar setting and affects as, as Buzzati's, remote military places where those who run them have to constantly deal with bureaucracy of a centralized state while remaining prepared against the imminent attacks and uprisings of the so-called anti-revolutionaries or the enemies of the Nizam. My ethnography in general then gives accounts of the Basij members who spend most of their time in the base filing official documents, participating in training workshops in Bandar Abbas, Islam Shah or elsewhere, holding classes for the youth and writing proposals to find sufficient funding to build schools 
in faraway villages. It might sound like a life of an academic disguised in a military uniform, but they of course did more. What they did was to get involved in governmental technologies. Governmental technologies as Rose and Miller defined them are the complex of mundane programs, calculations, techniques, apparatuses, documents, and procedures, which authorities utilize in order to shape the beliefs and conduct of others in desired directions by acting upon their will, their circumstances, or their environment. These technologies, they note, do not create an all-encompassing web of social control. Rather, they work through countless and often competing local tactics of care, persuasion, and encouragement. One of these techniques of government was to persuade the locals to become an active member of the besiege. In every besiege base in Iran, there is the human resources office that deals with membership. Once registered, you become a regular besiege. However, if you intend to benefit from the membership, in the form of loans, a reduction in months of military service, jobs, and so on, you have to go through special training and become an active member, which requires almost six months, providing that you take the courses intensively. Otherwise, the process can take years and often ends in failure. Therefore, one of the main tasks of the Basij, as Basij basis, is to keep a record of members, of members' activities and pass the final evaluation to the headquarters of the Basij. This is the assessment sheets on the basis of which regular Basijis are upgraded to active members. At the top, it reads ideological inquiry sheet for upgrading membership. The performance of the Basij members are evaluated numerically. The columns from right to left read on a scale of eight to 10, evaluate the belief of the respected member in the basics and principles of Islam. Next, belief and practical commitment to the Supreme Leader, eight to 20. Commitment to prayer, six to 15. Participation in religious and political ceremonies, four to 15. Observance of Islamic morality and Basij codes of conduct, four to 15. And finally, selflessness, selflessness and readiness for sacrifice, six to 15. Apart from the absurdity of the numerical measurement of virtues, what caught my attention uh, was how becoming an active member was presented to the locals as an act of care, because it provided them an opportunity to survive the rampant social problems and the bleak prospects. My ethnography is filled with such instances where violence, care and statecraft intersect. If you're interested, we can perhaps talk more about this uh, during the Q&A. What I meant to do with this example though, is to present you with a case where a paramilitary organization operates through the, the logic of care and audit culture, a logic that allows the top ranking members to infiltrate and monitor the everyday life of local residents, creating critical junctures the moments, practices, and techniques when care and militarism merge. It is through the merging of care and militarism that the besiege constantly create differences within the local community and maintain hierarchies in Iran's poor neighborhoods. The besiege of neighborhoods was the major place that initially led me to, to my recent and ongoing research project with the Afghan disabled foreign fighters. This part of the, my presentation is, is perhaps uh, closer to what you have already read in the, in the pre-circulated paper. In early 2015, when heavy uh, involvement of Iran and its auxiliary forces in Syria was largely a public secret, some publications crept in and started being circulated among the locals. Following up on the pub publication sources, and after many days of negotiations, I managed to know more about an oral history research team working under the supervision of the research offices of the Islamic Revolution Cultural Front in Tehran. Um, one of the defined activities of this pro-regime cultural institute was to document the untold stories of Afghan veterans whose fighting in the Iran-Iraq war had never been recorded before. 
The interviewees consisted mainly of the parents of martyrs and also disabled Afghan veterans who played a key role in assisting the research team to identify over 2,000 Afghans killed in the 1980s. The Afghan disabled veterans that I worked with were refugees, undocumented, and asylum seekers whose experience of militancy in the Middle East conflict zones was inseparable from their wartime migration to Iran, particularly their move to Iran in the immediate years after the 1979 Soviet invasions of Afghanistan. They carried different precarious legal documents made periodic visits to Afghanistan to see their extended families, perhaps not anymore now, and were mainly employed in renewal jobs. Here is a brief live narrative. Shams was 15 when he first came to Iran in the company of wounded military advisor. In the company of a wounded military advisor. Early in the 1979 revolution, when revolutionary guards sent members to train Afghan mujahideens in the war against the Soviet troops, an Iranian advisor was injured in the in an ambush. Shams's name was drawn up to transfer the wounded advisor to Iran via a short trip, short stop in Pakistan. As a reward for his bravery, Shams was sent to the Iranian city of Qom to pay tribute to the holy shrine where he decided to stay as a war refugee joining million more Afghans who had recently sought asylum in the country. Shortly after his resettlement, Iran-Iraq war broke out in 1980, when he joined the front as a soldier and laborer in constructing trenches. His participation in the, uh, in the Iran-Iraq war was intermittently interrupted as he was hospitalized for repeated injuries. In 2015 and in his late 40s, he left his job as a construction worker and joined other Iran-backed Afghan forces who took arm in defense of the Syrian regime. He remained in Syria for several months and went back to Iran when he was injured in, the right, in his right leg and became an amputee. During my field work, I realized how the live account, account of Afghans brings together three different but interrelated figures. Mujahid, Islamic art fighter, Mohajir, wartime, wartime migrant, and Kargar, menial labor. Taken together, not only do they question the dominant image of Islamic militants as time-worn figures of hyper-masculine hyper unruly populace, they reveal how, they, how these Afghans are only sporadically radical. Those episodes of armed fights in Afghanistan, Iran, and Syria are as much telling of transnational organized violence as it is about different regimes of mobility. Afghans recurring cross-border movements, sometimes as a fighter, a seasonal laborer, and some other times as a wartime displayed subject, show how they have been engaged in what Marston calls lived geopolitics, where Afghans author transregional routes and geographical imaginations by crossing multiple state boundaries and geopolitical projects. Given the importance of cross-border movements and labor mobility in Afghans' life course, it is not hard to frame Afghan fighters as military migrant workers, regardless of their ideological standings. As a common practice across the globe and across time, military workforce operating abroad is composed to a great, great extent from migrants imported from impoverished countries. The examples of which can be seen in the US recruitment techniques after the first, the first Gulf War and historically in the French and British colonial foreign legion. The method of offshoring labor creates military migrant worker as a distinct category of person subjected to governmental power without responsibilities owed to them by the polity they serve. Unlike citizen soldiers whose sacrifices are cons consecrated by the body politic, military migrant workers toil in war zone in support of a government to whom they are not bound by any social contract. And unlike mercenaries who maximize profits through their specialized military skills, they're blocked in deeply precarious contractual relationships that is modeled very much on the common labor contracts. For instance, 
this docu document on the right required to get disability benefits certifies that Muhammad Aziz Jafari has served in ground force of the Revolutionary Guards in Kurdistan as a daily wage laborer in 1983. In the face of protracted displacement and chronic precarity of Afghan military migrant workers, which imposes detrimental legal and economic strictures, combat injuries of Afghans situate them in dynamic claim-making procedures with the state institutions and give them a ground for negotiating state uh, care and obligations. It is the logic and infrastructure of these care negotiations that have led me to look into biomedical assessment of disability and how the bureaucracy around it works. A mundane part of the lives of people with disabilities in many countries is spent with, within medical committees, where injuries, in injury compensation and pensions are determined according to medical disability rating scales, which you see on the right, attributing the percentage to each imp impaired body part. Physicians in medical committees normally follow charts in which there are long lists of bodily functions, impairments, and percentage of each part in relation to the whole body. This modern medical, modern medical calculative tool has played a key role in the process of state building and social ordering in modern world. It basically works as a technology of government that inscribes numbers to people, that delineates who the able-bodied citizen is and determines what the responsibility of state is in protecting those were categorized as non-fit for work. In Iran, the idea of protection in case of injury was expressed and, de and demanded first during the constitutional revolution. Exposed to the injurious side of modern industrial labor, some workers demanded compensation for bodily injuries and permanent losses incurred at work and as in the rest of the world. As uh, Shayek discusses in his article, Development of Social Insurance in Iran, it, it took many years for this demand for workers to find its place within the bureaucratic system. The provisional disability scaling chart seems to be introduced to, to Iranians first through military colonial physicians, mostly French and Austrians during the Rajar era. However, a more fully fledged numerical Scale of disability in Iran, as far as I found traces of, was modeled after the Anglo-Persian oil company compensation scheme. As you can see, this is the, the, the chart explained lines, like loss of two or more limbs, 100. So this is uh, the scale from like 100 to zero. This is an example of physiological calculation of disability that was practiced by the Anglo oil company in 1940. This document, titled Defense of Abaddon and War Risk Insurance, it features correspondences about protecting Indian workers employed in oil fields of Iran against the risk of war in 1943. It also details how British employees, Indian subjects, and Iranian workers are to be compensated differently as they are subjected to different compensation schemes. For instance, in the absence of a functioning compensation scheme in Iran at the time, there is an, an agreement that injury of Iranian workers are to be calculated based on the Egyptian compensation scheme. As it emerges from this document, encoding the body into the disability classification system is not a neutral act. As it translates social hierarchies and inequalities into numerical figures. To go back to the case of disabled war veterans in Iran, medical committees follow this hierarchical logic as they stratify veterans in terms of percentage of disability and regulate the level of benefits that a disabled veteran is entitled to. This selective access to social welfare, which is predicated on the technical knowledge of experts, defines the political train upon which struggles of Afghans over state care are constituted. I often heard from the disabled veterans that their the percentage of disability was calculated incorrectly and the assigned percentage did not represent the true nature of their disability. 
As a matter of fact, they claimed it is impossible and morally wrong to quantify the extent of one's sacrifice and turn a religious virtue into economic value. To perform this dissatisfaction, Afghans moved from one office or institutions to another to express their discontent and try to increase their level of disability and thereby their benefits. This newly gained ability to face up to the state institutions and negotiate one's needs bears some resemblance to what Tiktin describes in her work on asylum seekers in France. Production of the disabled subjects in France at the intersection of, politi of the political economy and regimes of care. A, a counter intuitive subject that is more mobile when disabled, injured or diseased than when healthy. The visit of Afghans to uh, medical committees was not restricted to war related injuries. Some of the Afghans I worked with also suffered from impairments due to injuries in, in the workplace. In those cases, calculation and compensation of injuries are based both on medical assessment and religious and religious calculative logic. After the revolution and following the Islamization process, disability scaling chart was to become compatible with Islamic model of compensation, or what is known as DIA. And this is, and, and the image is, describes uh, the quantification of this DIA. This is a far more complex procedure in which physicians, insurance inspectors, and judges are involved and they have to translate medical rationality and religious principles into numbers. But this opens up a whole set of questions and I'm, 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 I'm very willing to talk about this like, and, and then this process of translation. As a conclusion, um, the theoretical and methodological tenets of the two projects I presented today stem from my long-term goal to investigate the potential for care to become a train of political belonging as well as inequalities. Writing, in, writing ethnographies of care in context of national and transnational violence, I try to go beyond romanticized framing of care that have dominated the scholarship in recent years. Rather, as I discussed through the two cases of the Basij and disabled veterans, I approach care as a set of practices that have the potential to become central to the construction and classifications of difference. And this way, care extends far beyond intimate relations and is ingrained in processes that establish belonging as well as various forms of inequality. Researching care in intimate settings, as well as in public sectors, enables bringing various committees, communities of care and grasping how the distribution of care not only mirrors inequalities, but contributes to their reproduction and even int intensification. But as final remarks, I just want to say a few sentences. I began my uh, presentation with describing the novel the Tartar Steep. I would like to end the talk with the same book, hoping it may speak to how we all feel these days about the caring revolutionary movement in Iran. After spending decades in the fort, the protagonist of the Tartar Steep rises to the position of second in command in the fort. But he then becomes ill and receives orders to leave the fort. As his dying by the body is stretched down the mountain towards the city, towards the city he left so long ago, he is passed by young soldiers and officers rushing to defend the fort against the invasion of the Tartars. The protagonist then dies in a little inn, tragically on the eve of the long awaited battle, having no time to find out which side eventually wins. The members of the Basij in Bandar Abbas and Islam Shah may not have to carry the feeling of meaninglessness of waiting for the imminent attack that the novel's protagonist had to endure over the decades. As Basijis have been more frequently called for, called for to confront the crowd in the last few years. However, the Basijis are most certainly not as fortunate as the protagonist who does not get a chance to find out what the result of the confrontation would be. 
The result for the besieged is already there, a total defeat. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Ahmed. Okay, I just closed it. Um, so I, I'm going to take a few minutes uh, to share some thoughts, um, and then um, uh, and then we'll open it up for a broader discussion. Um, I was fortunate enough to read a, um, a wonderfully rich, um, uh, I think, forthcoming publication of, of Ahmad's related to this project. Um, it, it, a lot of the themes he discussed here today were already in the essay, uh, but I, I think the essay also goes somewhat beyond what he also shared with you. So uh, excuse me that my some of my comments may seem a little bit off, um, off cue to, to some of you, uh, because they're, they're kind of based on my reading of, of the essay, but I think overall the, the themes are, are, are quite relevant. Um, now, this is truly a, 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 you know, a wonderful, wonderfully original, and I, I feel very important study of trying to understand the complexities of Iranian, uh, Iranian society today uh, in the 21st century, trying to grapple with the multiple ways in which care and militarism intersect, uh, the complexities and the blurred boundaries between refugee and fighter, um, between care and militarism, between care on the systems of transnational violence, as, as uh, Ahmed just put it. Um, so I'm, I'm really uh, uh, happy and, and glad that we've had an opportunity to hear from um, Ahmed. Now, Ahmed this, uh, examines, uh, this, in, in this essay especially, he examines um, how disabled Iranian and Afghan veterans demand social welfare benefits. And in the process of doing so, they confront and oppose existing social hierarchies, right? Hier hierarchies of sacrifice, and hierarchies of belonging or citizenship. In the case of sacrifice, uh, this was the central concept deployed by the Iranian state to recruit men for the Iran-Iraq war, and then uh, more recently send fighters to Syria to quote unquote, protect the holy shrines and fight ISIS or Daesh over there in Syria rather than uh, in uh, Iran itself. This sacrif sacrificial reasoning, uh, the term that uh, Ahmad deploys, however, has been bureaucratized in the form of, in various forms, but including in the form of percentages of disability, with 25% as this key threshold for meaningful social benefits um, that accrue to these veterans. This biological citizenship based on damaged bodies or the degree of uh, the damage to one's body tries to shut down questions about how to measure disability, how to measure sacrifice, and instead turn them into cold mathematical measurements. Moral virtues of sacrifice, brotherliness, piety are all translated into quantifiable, auditable measures of loss of limbs, nerve damage, um, and, and, uh, and the responsibility for broken bodies. And as you just saw here, he, you know, he also paints a uh, you know, beautiful uh, hundred year history of, of this attempt to bureaucratize uh, uh, disability and damage and, and uh, you know, wonderful uh, illustration of kind of a, a, a process in which uh, Iran has been imp uh, implicated uh, and imbricated into a kind of a global history of, 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 of insurance companies and companies and firms trying to measure disability. Now, these translations have real consequences, or to, to use Ahmed's term, they are not neutral acts. They can send some people and their families into poverty. They can decide interest rates on loans. They can provide housing or subsidies for housing. They can help educate children. And for Afghans whose family members can be, uh, can be recognized as martyrs, this is an opportunity for citizenship. Um, I forget the exact year, I believe it was in 2016, um, the, the Iranian parliament issued, um, uh, passed the bill in which Afghan martyrs, those who are deemed as martyrs by the state, are entitled to citizenship. So if an Afghan family is able um, to uh, make claims that their family member, their father, their husband, or martyrs that will open the door to their uh, pathway to uh, citizenship. Now, 
By integrating Afghan veterans into a study, Ahmed allows us to consider another hierarchy, the one between citizen and non-citizens. Even those who have lived and labored in Iran for decades may have been born in Iran and may even be married to Iranians, right? These Afghans mobilize the state's own discourse of brotherliness, whether it's Shia brotherliness or Persian speaking brotherliness or the term um, khun uh, shariki that Afghans use all in a hope uh, for full inclusion, a hope that seemingly uh, that, that Ahmed discovers is oftentimes not realized. Now, the many things we learned from Ahmed's presentations, uh, presentation here, but also from the essay that I was fortunate to read, as he points out, it, it's quite shocking that so few of us even know about Afghans fighting in the Iran-Iraq war. Uh, it, we, we, we heard about it and heard about the Fatimiyun Brigade and so forth when it came to Iran's involvement in the Syrian war, but it's it's quite fascinating to, to, to acknowledge uh, a longer, deeper history that he uh, is able to uh, uncover in the midst of his, his research. Um, another important point, which comes out more in the paper than the presentation, but I'll, I'll, I'll raise it here and maybe we can pick up on it, is um, Ahmed shows that the discourse of equality um, was mobilized by these veterans against the state's discourse of injustice or justice. Um, what I want to add here is that in my, my reading of Iranian society, equality and combating discrimination, rather than the, the, the issue of justice, has been in fact the central theme of political struggles in Iran for the past two decades. And it is striking to see that over the past decade or so, veterans, both Iranian and Afghans, have evoked equality, right, in their struggles for greater compensation. So just like women activists and women, ordinary women who, who evoke equality, mm. just like working class Iranians, laborers and union members who evoke equality, and just like reformists that were, or groups of po political actors that we call reformists over the past uh, two, to, uh, two, two decades, 25 years, who have pushed the notion of equality before law, uh, uh, rule of law, equality is the bedrock of this struggle. Now, like everything, like everything these days, it's hard to talk about or think about or read about Iran and not think about the events that have been transpiring over the past six, seven weeks. Um, and it's difficult not to contemplate the issues presented by uh, Dr. Moradi without thinking about the present uh, moment, the current conjuncture. At present, when we are inundated with videos of brutal violence on the part of the Basij and plain clothes, plain clothes uh, forces, a present or a current moment where besides the over 250 Iranian men, women, and children who have been killed for, pro for attending protests, rumors swirl that the Islamic Republic may be turning to foreign fighters, foreign security forces to smash the Jina Masa Amini protests that are now well into their sixth week. A current moment where the provision of care by the state seems to be the last thing on the minds of bureaucrats and politicians, even if we learn of people being killed, uh, pe that, uh, even as, as we learn that people, some of the people who are, who are killed are wrongly claimed by the state as members of the Basij and therefore labeled as martyrs or mislabeled as mm -hmm. martyrs. Now, supporters of the women and men who disobey the regime and confront the Basij are lauded for their bravery and their sacrifices, right? While the Basij who are shooting pellets, paintballs, and live ammunition at, at these uh, protesters are described by state TV and staunch supporters of the leader as being mazloom and innocent and, in, and, 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 and uh, being an embodiment of, of national sacrifice. We are left to wonder whose sacrifice will count, whose sacrifice will be recognized and be recognized by what sorts of systems of care, right? Regardless of what transpires in the weeks and months and years to come. Now, I was wondering if Ahmed's intimate study of members of the Basij and the IRC, IRGC, IRGC, IRGC across generations allows him to think about what these ongoing struggles, may, uh, how these ongoing struggles may reverberate through the hierarchies which he so carefully illustrates operate through these organizations and how it may intersect with the existing prevailing struggles around equality that these interlocutors, his interlocutors are engaged in. 
So I'll, I'll put that as kind of one bundle of questions that he may want to take up. Uh, I have another uh, two other bundles of questions, one, one around method or methodology, and then um, a few questions about some concrete um, analytical and, and empirical issues. On methodology, um, as you explained here in, in the presentation, but also in the paper that I read, um, your research is based on long-term participant observations and interviewing with an array of officials and ordinary uh, veterans or Basij members, doctors, bureaucrats, veterans, families of martyrs, Iranian citizens, Afghans or non-citizens non of Iran. You met people in offices, in cemeteries, and in informal, and informal charity groups. You, you looked at official oral history projects as well as, as, as well as listening to the life stories of veterans and families of martyrs, um, uh, their, own, their, their, their own life stories directly from them. But since we have, I think, a number of graduate students here who are also interested in, in doing the, the types of uh, kind of uh, empirically rigorous type of research that you've done, Ahmed, I was wondering if I can ask you to reflect a little more on both how you were able to gain access into these communities, um, how your discussion may have been shaped by your position as an Iranian, but I, I assume a non basij member based in Europe, um, at least for the last uh, decade or so, someone who's, um, but also ask you to share with us what worked for you, what gave you access, maybe what failed and what led to walls being built and, and uh, what led to doors being closed in your face or ended conversations and maybe reflect on those moments of quote unquote research failure and what they tell us about uh, ba the Basij and Afghans and their place and position in Iranian society. So more general question about methodology. Um, three, three brief questions or comments uh, and questions about that you may want to respond to. One is about um, subjecthood. Now your examination nicely shows how, th how these people move across different categories from being a refugee or muhajir into becoming a fighter or mujahid, becoming veterans, becoming claimants, becoming Afghan outsiders, and occasionally, I guess, becoming Iranian citizens or new Iranian citizens. Your essay forces us to think about the relationship between the individual claimants and the state. But is there a space for seeing these str struggles and these strategies expand to a larger scale? Clearly, and then several times in your paper and here even in your presentation, you evoke family and kinship. And the, the, the next of kin is an important person here. Do you see any sign e uh, of even larger collectives coming into play, neighborhood or community? Can neighborhood sacrifice? Can Afghans in total be compensated? Can we think of these larger scales? Do you see glimmers of light for that? Second, you nicely show that uh, states have multiple and sometimes competing rationalities. This was beautifully done and in some ways an exemplary uh, example of, uh, of ethnography of the state, uh, something that I, I think we sorely miss in, in, in contemporary studies of Iranian politics. But, multi but multiplicity of objectives and fragmentation of bureaucracy led me to think about alternative doctors, alternative insurance com companies, alternative Basij headquarters or offices. Are there ways for these veterans to use, successfully or not, different venues, different dimensions of the state against itself? The medical, the labor, the, uh, uh, labor offices, the welfare offices, the city council and so forth. Can they play in a sense the state off of it, each other? And are some Iranians, as well as Afghans, better equipped to navigate this variegated um, uh, network of control, as you described it, um, rather than others? Does it matter what family you're from? Does it matter what class, your class position or your parents' class position? Does it matter your place of birth or your place of residence? And I wonder if you could share some insights from your research. And last, um, on the question of, of Afghans, you, you rightly point out there are very, Afghans have very different legal statuses in Iran. Some are, um, uh, some are undocumented, quote unquote, some are asylum seekers, some are officially uh, registered as refugees. Uh, I was just wondering if uh, this shapes uh, their legal status in a sense, does this shape who becomes a volunteer for these um, 
or joins the Basij and, and who doesn't? And does, and does that shape who does receive social benefits and, and doesn't? In a sense, are there certain Afghans are, that are more, are more included into this system of care and violence than, than others? And, and maybe there isn't, but I was just curious about that. Um, so that was a lot, maybe too many questions and comments for you, uh, uh, Ahmed, but maybe, maybe what we'll do is we'll give you about five to 10 minutes, no more, mm -hmm. to just pick up on the threads that you, you like to discuss. And then what I'm gonna ask is uh, our, the audience members, they're, they're welcome to pose their questions in the chat function, and then we'll turn, pick those up after Ahmed is, is finished. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for all these uh, thought-provoking uh, questions and comments. Um, so I'm going to start with the methodology. I think this is uh, something that I would like more to talk about now. Um, I want to start with this uh, with this strong feeling that we all have these days, which is like the rage against the regime. So if I get a chance to do to go back and do field work. I will not be able to do it again. So this is something, and, and, and the revising of the book and all this article, I, I had to stop it. It's just like, it's too much, um, too many emotions right now to just sit down and, and, and have the focus and to think about like people who are killing, uh, killing the protesters on the street. This is, this is beyond my capacity now. Um, so, but in terms of um, uh, the access and, and the, the practicalities of doing field work in Iran, um, I did it in 2015 and I was, um, I had this idea that I uh, only hold the Iranian nationality. And I have, I had this naive idea that, okay, so I'm a citizen of this country, so I am allowed to ask questions. And, I, and it basically worked to, to, to a larger extent. And I was quite honest. When I uh, approached uh, like the authorities, I always uh, had this like official document from the University of Manchester that my supervisor uh, signed. And it was just like, okay, so I come from this institution and this is where um, I'm doing my PhD. But remember, I grew up here. I just left the country when I was 27, right? So this is, that was the, the whole uh, encounter. And we should not really underestimate the, the role of probably the, the gender there. So it's partly the, the, the nationality. The other one is just like the gender. So I, it was, perhaps easier for me to navigate these like um, heavily masculine, uh, probably uh, the uh, and, and environments. But I failed on many, many, many occasions. So many of my calls, just uh, they, uh, people didn't pick up my phones after uh, we, we just talked and we set a, a meeting. Um, I was um, once or twice called by the Revolutionary Guards Intelligence Force on the phone to just like go and meet them just to check up on me and like who I am and all this. And I'm describing all these encounters in, in my book. Uh, but what was very difficult back then was like how I negotiated the topic with my brother, with my family, with my uh, friends. It's just like, okay, so why, what, why do you, why are you, what are you doing? So why, and, and the whole, the, the reactions ranged from like this, why do you deal with these stupid people to like, okay, so you have to be careful uh, not to get caught. So it was just like a range of feelings because everyone has a, an opinion about the prestige and it's just like, it's, it's, it's a massive organization and it's at the same time a, a, quite a messy organization. And, and it works like the state, it's not the state, people are afraid of it, but people rely on that. So it's, it's a very complicated organization and, 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 and different people navigate it differently. So as a scholar, I had my own ideas. For instance, I was I I I, I finally I chose to stay in my hometown and there was to do my field work, and and those who were in that base, uh, we were uh, we went to school together, so it was much easier to get access and to discuss and to build trust. Um, so, but in in terms of like, and and I think this is part of this uh, the, this idea of multiple rationalities of the state. When you're dealing with the uh, um, and and one one thing which is very important is to, is to analytically distinguish between statehood, what is the nizam, and what is the government, 
So the goal, so statehood is this nizam, is this total uh, totality of a political system. But but government is just like the daily management of the population and all this. And within this, there are uh, many contradictions. And and the, the whole project of the Islamic Republic is based on a big contradiction, which is being Islamic and being republic. And that that has contributed to creating this. Um, and multiple rationalities. On the one hand, you have like the Shia principles. On the other hand, you have to deal with mother uh, technologies of bureaucracy, which in itself is quite oppressive. It's quite like violent. And, and, and it's the legacy of, of, of many different projects of governance from different countries. And, and that of course, um, is an impediment for many Afghans because it's very difficult to navigate. But at the same time, it can open and they are allowed or, 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 or some of them are better equipped to navigate the system by, for instance, by uh, getting connections to high ranking officials. For instance, when um, uh, one of uh, the Afghan uh, fighters could not register his uh, son at school, which back then it was very difficult to do. He just made a call to his commander in, uh, who, who served in Syria as, a, as an advisor. And then um, he, could able, he was able to do that. So this is part of like this local trust in, in, which is created and, and, and the network that uh, Afghans were able to create after participating in, 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 the, in the Syrian war. So it means, yes, Af some Afghans are more included within the system. Um, and, and that's again, the question of government. You're dealing with it on different scales on, and in different, uh, in different spaces, like school, um, the insurance, um, I don't know, like finding a job, um, which is normally menial and all this. Yes, of course. So it's, it's partly about like how to navigate the bureaucracy and how connected you are to some, influential people but in the system um but the, the the last thing that i wanted to say was which is very important for me is is the importance of family and kinship and how um disability and individual claim making scales up to um, the collective which is the family or the neighborhood it did happen in in different occasions and what I do, what I am, uh, what I did, and what I'm doing is like to collect the complaints. So the complaints that the Afghans made, like collectively as a family or in in meetings in the neighborhoods in Islam Shah, was um, an, a lens to see how they are navigating the state, how they understand and imagine the state, and the care that it can provide, or how it it's disregarding. Uh, them in, in general. And, and so this is, but it's quite fragile, that community. And, and because we, you can simply call them the community of loss. The loss brought them together, but it's fragile. Like all the communities that are uh, like under the attack of the Islamic Republic and the surveillance of this. So I will stop the here and then we'll see questions. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you for your, your reflections on this. Um, and right on cue, we have a question in the in the in the chat. I, it seems a bit redundant for me. Well, I, I'll read it out. This is from uh, just so you know, uh, uh, Ahmed. This is one from one of our PhD students, Brian Plungis, who writes um, the connection to the uh, Anglo-Iranian oil company bureaucracy is quite fascinating as it seems that the company was trying to incentivize a different kind of wartime sacrifice, uh, World War II. Um, how did returning to these histories help you analyze or better understand the intertwined categories of race, citizenship, and disability under the Islamic Republic? Or is the main legacy of these uh, 1940s um, charts here the technocratic effort to quantify disability to engage the non-working um, uh, body. Um, very good. And, and maybe, um, if I, I, maybe if you could just, how did you even, 
what made you think to say that, oh, maybe there's something, you know, how did you even end up in, in these AO, uh, anglo running oil company files, I guess? Because I was just doing a research about like uh, the, um, the oil companies' neighborhoods. So that was a research project, um, on, uh, an, art, an art project, basically. So I was reading it and I was just quite hooked to the uh, Qatar uh, online library. I was just just like browsing all the documents that they uh, just uh, just just scanned and basically uh, made it available to the public because the British did, didn't didn't do it. <laughs> um, but, and so basically, I was just like reading. I was doing uh, uh, the the work with the uh, disability disabled Afghans, and at the same time doing this like this project about the oil oil company neighborhoods. And then I thought like, okay, so let's check disability. And risks and war and all this that all the all the uh, the keywords that I'm trying to do, and I found the document. So that was just like my pure accident. And then I read um, I read the uh, the article by Cyrus Shire, and then then uh, he explains that it, there was the correspondences between like uh, and, and, and the um, AIOC and, 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 and those authorities who were doing the insurance company and uh, building this and developing it. What, was, what is important, I think, is just like, so the connection that I found back then, and, and, and I'm still working on it, uh, it's an ongoing work now, ongoing project. What is important is just like how it, the colonial medicine was enshrined within the Islamic Republic's uh, bureaucracy. And this is a legacy that comes from the, Shah, uh, the regime of Shah. So this is the process of modernization. But what happened after the, uh, after the revolution was like they, uh, the, the Islamic Republic tried to Islamicize everything. It doesn't really mean that they, uh, they broke away from all those like modernization processes. And that's a legacy. So colonial medicine is a legacy that is basically everywhere now. It's not like in Iran. It's just part of the bureaucracy and history of disability that is so uh, in, uh, enshrined within the bureaucracy. So this is the connection. And of course, race is there. And, and race, and, and, and there is this like, uh, connection between objectivity that the system tries and pretends to do and the, this system of uh, like quantification and evaluation of disability. So like, for instance, Afghans cannot really talk eloquently when they uh, present themselves because most of them are illiterate because they were marginalized. So when they go to the medical committees, they cannot really show and explain their impairments and disabilities because there is a difference between impairments to the bodily function and what the doctor evaluates as disability. So this requires some sort of explanation and they are incapable of doing this uh, because of the history of marginalization. So I would say race plays, uh, race plays a, a role here, of course, and the kind of citizenship, the kind of rights you have and the kind of disability uh, that you live at the end, the kind of recognition you get for your impairments. Yeah. Thank you, Brian, for, for the question. Good. I'm inviting others to pose their questions or share their reactions. But just to clarify that the actual charts, do, I mean, just, just to clarify that the actual charts don't differentiate between Afghan and Iranian loss of limb or, you know, if, 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 if an Afghan can demonstrate that this, this is from a, a disability uh, generated from um, being participating in the war, they would get the same percentage. It's just uh, the actual- This is the assumption. This is the assumption that, that, that happens when they go to the, uh, go to the committees. And, and it's all about like the, on the principle of objectivity and, 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 and transparency and, and, and quantification. But, but the, at the end, the results are completely different. And of course, like it depends on like, and on, for instance, disabled uh, Iranian disabled veterans are more equipped to go to different uh, like institutions or to appeal and, and, and do all this, but with an Afghan, perhaps not. And that's just like where it creates all, this, uh, all those inequalities and hierarchies and perpetuates them.
Other questions from the floor? Yeah, we have um, uh, uh, Dai Wang um, writes, thank you for a very informative presentation, Dr. Moradi. I wonder if there is a mismatch between the state's policy and the local government's practice regarding how care should be provided to veterans. What, were, what are the channels through which a veteran can seek um, change? And maybe in the context of responding to that, could you, I mean, for, for many of us who are quite ignorant, to what extent is um, are these uh, Basij uh, headquarters or the organizationally, to what extent is it uh, um, kind of divided in terms of locality and province and so forth, or and to what to how centralized is it? Um, and the, the question here suggests that it may not be, which is my sense too. But I just wanted to, you know, how how, how centralized or decentralized should we think of it? Yeah. So in terms of like the 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 the, the care policies for the disabled veterans is quite uh, centralized. Um, veterans though can go to different uh, medical committees in different like um, in major big cities. And, and they do that. But when it comes to the Basij, and, and that's a very interesting question, is just like, it is divided into three uh, scales. So you have like the main uh, uh, Basij headquarters, and then you, you've got like in each uh, provinces, you've got like one, um, uh, one branch, and then it goes to different like dis districts and then to the neighborhoods. So there are the, these hierarchies. And what happens, and, and you've got the police, of course. And then they have to be in, in, in connection to the police um, in different ways and, and, and other institutions. So what happens is just like, I am so, um, and when I see the videos and all this, what comes to my mind is just like, okay, of course they are completely, so they, they, they try to be spontaneous, but I imagine that so many uh, works go behind this and, and the attempts to coordinate this. And of course, it's impossible to coordinate this. So it's, it's a complete mess, but there are attempts to coordinate them. And, and this is the major complaint of people in the, in, in, in the besiege of neighborhoods. Whatever they want to try and, and to do in and implement in the neighborhoods, they have to have the permission from uh, the headquarters of the city. And then that city should ask like the, the, the province and all this. So it's like uh, running, I don't know, school or whatever. You need to be in coordination with them and you need to report back. Um, uh, so that's, uh, th that's interesting when something happens at, and, and while and a violent act happens, um, and people call them like spontaneous, they, it, it happens spontaneously or whatever, no. They have to be accountable. They uh, and and they try to be accountable. They they respond back, but not to the public, and that's how it is. It is it is happening. Um, but but this is the differentiation. Like the, for the veterans and care, it's, it's a completely different thing. It, these are the, the medical committees for the the, the besiege of neighborhoods. There are scales and and there are different uh, coordinations happening. We have, uh, we have time for another question or two. The audience. Um, we have one from uh, Sorar who writes, uh, how would this mechanism of getting care from Basij impacts the view of non-Basij Iranians of the Afghan people, right? And I, for the audience members who are maybe less familiar uh, with Iran, um, I think we have quite a few here, who may be less familiar with Iranian society. It's important to understand that the, the non-Basij Iranian, the Sarek uh, correctly points out, it has antipathies towards the Basij, but also has, uh, no, you know, within that uh, sector of Iranian society, there's a lot of um, distrust, frankly, just racism towards Afghans as well. And if you could just, to talk about and reflect on, on that kind of that, that multiplicity of, of, of uh, discrimination. Yes, and, and what, so what I do and, 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 and what I can comment on uh, regarding this question is that uh, my work with Afghans in the uh, neighborhood, one of the neighborhoods in Islamshah. 
So what I'm focusing on is the relationship between uh, Iranian neighbors to their Afghan neighbors there. Those who, are, who, those who participated in the war got injured or, 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 or died and the families have to deal with the, uh, with the Iranians. The Iranians who are, who are mostly suspicious of, of the intention of Afghans for going to Syria. And, and, and if not like against being against the regime and all the brutalities that they did, they are suspicious that uh, what Afghans did was for money. So basically I can call my, uh, this part of ethnography, the ethnography of being Mosdur. So, it's, and, and this word is just like uh, being used widely in Iran. And, and what I did uh, as part of, as doing like this ethnographic uh, work was like to follow how uh, Afghans uh, um, ask their neighbors to sign the petitions. With this petition, they were able to get more benefits. But the neighborhoods, the neighbors, the Iranian neighbors, should have tested that. Uh, uh, should have tested that uh, the Afghan neighbor is is poor, and it's called Mosar. So it's um, it's it's just like poor that and cannot like afford a, a, a decent life. But many of like and and that was just like an ongoing negotiation between Afghans and their neighbors because they the, the Iranian uh, in Iran, some of the Iranians didn't really accept the fact that they are not getting rich and and they accused uh, Afghans to of, of like uh, getting uh, a lot of money in dollar and all this. So it was a, it, it's it's a it's a very complicated situation. And, 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 the, and the neighborly relation and the history of the intimate relations between neighbors are overshadowed by the national uh, struggles and the transnational violence uh, that, that, that the Islamic Republic perpetuates in the, in the region. And you can see it in, on, on, on a daily basis. So that's how um, I'm, I'm trying to, to just like explain the difficulties of everyday life for Afghans who are returning home and then being accused of like uh, a series of, 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 of different things. Yeah. And the motivation, their motivations are being interrogated in, in a sense. Exactly. exactly. Very good, very interesting. Um, any last uh, comments or questions from the audience members? Well, with, with that, I, I'm gonna, oh, well, we have a fantastic. Um, with that, I'm gonna agree with uh, Norma Morizzi's evaluation, um, uh, subjective, not, not based on a chart or a percentile system, uh, that this was a wonderful uh, event, a wonderful pre uh, presentation of a very rich uh, project. We look forward to following the developments of this research and hopefully um, other writings and whether it comes in articles or book form or and maybe some even artistic uh, presentations that you're working on. So um, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Ahmed, for a wonderful presentation. And I would like to thank the audience for joining us um, today. And um, I hopefully we will see all of you um, in on the, December 8th for our last event for the fall semester. I see my colleague Ali Mispas, he has, un, has opened up his video, so maybe he wants to say something. Just I want to say thank you for a, a great talk and thank you, Aran, for for your um, very thoughtful questions and thank you, everyone. See you all on on December eighth. Okay, okay. Well, end this. I'll stop the recording now.